and welcome to Duck Quacks Don't Echo. This is a show where we reveal some of the most bizarre and brilliant facts you've ever heard. Each of tonight's guests have brought along their own favourite fact, which we will be putting to the test to decide whose is best. So before we hear the facts, let's see who's joining me tonight. Well, a fact about my first guest is he performed his first stand-up gig when one of the performers didn't turn up and he had to fill in. So I think I speak for everyone when I say, thank goodness it wasn't a burlesque night. It's Jason Mafford. <laughs> An interesting fact about my second guest is, for three years at the Edinburgh Festival, we shared a flat together. We had very definite rules. If he brought a girl back, he put a sock on the door handle to his room. And if I brought a girl back, well... Well, we never got to that. Please welcome <laughs> Noel Fielding. <laughs> and a fact about my final guest is that she was single and lived with her nan until she was 32. Interesting conversation <laughs> when you meet someone in a bar, isn't it? <laughs> All right, babe, do you want to come back to mine for an Ovaltine and a Werther's original? It's <laughs> Roisin Quality. <laughs> OK, let's get on with the show. All of tonight's guests have brought in a fact they really love, but who's his best? It's time for round one, Fact Off. <laughs> OK, Roisin, you're up first. What is your fact? My fact is local people are very bad at giving directions because of the curse of knowledge. What do you mean, the curse of knowledge? Um, the curse of knowledge is when something is too familiar to you to explain it to someone else. So, once you learn something and you know it so well, your brain loses the neural pathways needed to know how you know that information, to pass it on to someone else. So, a lot of people, so teachers, struggle with it because they've learned the information, but then they lose the neural pathways that helped them learn the information, which is the information that contains the information they need to pass on to other people. Look, look, love, I just want to know where the post office is. <laughs> 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 it's so. That's incredible. So you have something called the curse of knowledge. I've never had the curse of knowledge. I've always had blissful ignorance. It's, much <laughs> it's a bit like, do you ever get this when people say to you, like, how do you do stand-up? How do you get on stage? And because you're doing it so Sorry, long. sorry, they don't say that. They say, why to me? <laughs> 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 but that, that, because we've been doing it for so long now, that's gone for us. So we, I sort of have that, like, how do you not do it? I, I don't really... The bit that we would go to explain to someone would be not the bit they need to know. So you mean you've lost the ability to tell someone? Yeah. ..about how you start? Are you any good at giving directions, Noel? I've got that kind of look where people think, mm, he's not going to know where he's going. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but doesn't everyone have the same rules to follow asking directions? If you ask directions, they start speaking, you listen to the first bit, which is go down there. The yeah. rest is all confusing. You think, yeah. I'll ask again when I'm down there. <laughs> That's the rules of directions, right? You basically just start looking at their moustache yeah, or something. Like, after about five minutes, you, you honestly think I'm going to remember this, do you, mate? <laughs> Who is still asking for directions? I mean, you've got all the information in your pocket on your phone. It's like someone going, what time is it? You'd be like, are you from the past? <laughs> I'll tell you how, how old-fashioned I am. When you just said you've got all the information in your pocket, I was thinking, come on, Jason, who writes down the information now? <laughs> I did, for a minute. You've heard what this lot think, but there's only one way to find out for sure, so we put it to the test. It's good to know that in the event of getting lost, we can always rely on the solid knowledge of the locals to get us out of trouble. It turns out they're actually the last people to ask for help. The more you know about something, the harder it can be to put yourself in the place of someone who knows nothing. This is called the curse of knowledge. It can apply to almost anything, but asking for directions is a particularly nice example. Locals who are most familiar with a place can't give helpful direction to someone new because it is almost impossible for them to literally put themselves in the place of that person. Like an expert using confusing jargon, they will give directions that rest on assumptions that the stranger doesn't have. Good teachers overcome this, but it takes a lot of effort. Usually we explain things badly and our audience is completely lost. And so, paradoxically, the best advice you can get is often from someone who's nearly as confused as you. To test the theory, we took a trip to the historic suburban town of St Albans. We tasked an actor to play a confused American tourist. His job was to ask locals who had lived there for years for directions to some well-known landmarks in the town. But before we did that, in order to get a benchmark of how long the route should take, we got a control group of five people to follow a good old-fashioned map and see what the average time was for them to get there. The route was from Hatfield Road to the town hall, so off the people went following the map. On average, using the map, this route took our control group seven minutes and 37 seconds. 
It was now time for our American tourist to find a local and see how he got on using their directions. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Could you tell me how to get to the town hall? Yeah, of course. Mechanic Steve has lived in St. Albans for 30 years and knows the town intimately. You see the blue roundabout sign just up there? Yeah. You go to there, you turn right. You follow that road round, which bears slightly right and then left. You come to the magistrate's court. You turn right up by the magistrate's court, past the bank, follow it along till you come to the main road, turn left, and it's just down there on the right. All right, thank you. You're more than welcome. Our tourist then followed local Steve's directions. If the science was correct, his journey should take considerably longer than the map, even though he was getting directions from someone who's lived there for 30 years. And amazingly, this was the case. Steve's route took over one and a half minutes longer, coming in at nine minutes, 15 seconds. The science seemed to be working, but maybe our first local just wasn't much good at giving directions. So we repeated the test with a different local and a different destination. This time it was to Ye Old Fighting Cock's pub from the town center. It took our control group an average of eight minutes, 51 seconds to reach the destination following a map. How would a local compare? Could you help me get to the Ye Olde Fighting Cock's pub? Hairdresser Lorraine has spent over half a century in St. Albans. Let's see if it will affect the quality of the direction she gives. Um, you take the road down here, um, get to the clock tower, turn right, and then you go down a road, and the first left, you've got the cathedral on the right, on the left, and the boys' school on the right. There's an archway, and you just go straight the way down. Okay. It's a really nice pub. Really okay. nice pub. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> see much. See ya. Bye. Our tourist set off on his journey, but quickly became lost. Eventually, he reached the destination in 10 minutes, 55 seconds, about two minutes longer than our control group. And we saw these results time and time again. If you sort of head, take a left here, there's like a sort of an alleyway which comes out into an arch. So there you have it. Directions from locals really are bad due to the curse of knowledge. So uh, there you go. That's pretty, uh, pretty concrete proof, isn't it? I remember doing gigs with you where you were driving, and between the pair of us, we had no idea how to get but from A to B. But that was pretty sat nav, wasn't it? I know, yeah. Me and you used to just get... We were two hours late for gigs. Yeah, we could yeah. be going up the motorway the wrong way. Did you ever play Beat the Sat Nav? Did you ever play that when the sat, when, like, the sat nav goes, oh, you're going to arrive at 22.15, and you're like, we'll see you about it. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm lost, I'll just follow a car because he looks like he knows where he's going. <laughs> OK, thankfully, every week we're joined by our resident experts who can tell us a little bit more about this fact. So please welcome specialist in cell biology and genetics, Dr Emily Grossman, rocket scientist, Dr Simon Foster, and expert in space and mechanical engineering, Dr Maggie Adair in Pocock. It's our verifiers. <laughs> so we were talking about the curse of knowledge, but surely having some knowledge is better than having none, right? Well, in everyday life, obviously, it's best to know some stuff, but on the internet, if you want to find the correct answer to something, it's best to actually put the wrong answer up. So, which sounds really weird, but this theory comes from the wiki creator, Walt Cunningham. It's actually called Cunningham's Law. And he states that if you want to get a right answer, don't ask a question, pose the wrong answer, because everyone loves correcting oh, yeah. people. So, you know, if you put a question out, people go, oh, I can't be bothered to answer that. But by actually correcting someone, you make yourself look superior and all great. So everyone's kind of always jumping on you and trying to actually find stuff out. So that's the best way to do it, actually, is to put the wrong stuff out there. <laughs> So that was Roisin's fact, but how good was it? That's down to our studio audience. So using your keypads on a scale of 1 to 10, how impressed were you? Please vote now. So, let's find out what the average rating was from our audience. Roisin got a six. That's not a bad start. <laughs> so, we've heard Roisin's favourite fat, but join us after the break when Noel will be trying to win us over with his. Dr. Quackstone Echo, the show that puts extraordinary facts to the test. Still with me are Jason Manford, Noel Fielding and Roisin Conaty. 
Before the break, we saw Roisin win six points for a fact that locals aren't good at giving directions because of the curse of knowledge. Noel, you're next. What facts have you gone for? OK. You can identify your mum by smell alone. My mum? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is actually your mum. <laughs> <laughs> she stinks. <laughs> <laughs> no. Your own your mum. Own mum. Right. Everyone can uh, identify their own mum by, by smell, smell alone. alone. Yeah. yeah, with me, it's Benton and Edges and Werther's original. <laughs> <laughs> do, you think, do you think there is some evolutionary reason for yes, it? Yes, it goes back even further than that. And further they... than evolution? <laughs> 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 to day one. <laughs> Bang! So, how far back are we talking? No, about... but you're right, it is to do with evolution. I think it's basically, uh, we should be able to um, identify our relations, our mother, father and brother and sisters, so that we keep the gene pool clean. I think, I think the Mac family have got a bit more evolution in their system than this, cos we recognise each other just by the wag of our tails. <laughs> So you're saying, like, so there's a smell that your parents or siblings give off that makes yes. you go, I'm definitely not going to mate with them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you think you can smell your mum, Roshi? <laughs> Have you brought her in? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I definitely could. Could you? Yeah. How would you describe that smell? Uh, of comfort, that um, washing thing. Oh, right. oh, I thought you meant... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so disappointing for a mum. Yeah. Oh, I smell of comfort. No, oh, for washing she, powder. White... <laughs> My mum ran away when we were kids. She smells of vanish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, no, you obviously believe this fact is true, so you'll be able to prove it when we test it out. But before we do, let's see the science behind it. Smell is often a good indicator for things we like and things we should avoid. And much like our animal cousins, we use our sense of smell to identify our family members. As soon as we're born, we learn to recognise our mother by her smell. This is something that sticks with us as we grow and mature. Being able to recognise family members from when we're young to when we're adult is important for improving our gene pool. It's how we avoid inbreeding. When we come to choose a mate, strangers smell more appealing than family members. So there you go. The next time you lose your mother in the supermarket, instead of calling her, it may be more beneficial to take a sniff. OK, Noel, so to test your fact, we need some mums and we need their offspring. Our children's smell testers are already here. Now, you will have noticed that we only have four children here and that's because our fifth tester will be our very own Dr Emily Grossman. Please come and join us, Emily. <laughs> Welcome to the test area. <laughs> Now, all we need is their mums. So, sons and daughters, obviously, you're not allowed to see the order that your mums stand in. So, could you all put your blindfolds on, please? Do you remember last week in the green room we were chatting about Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> what are you looking at? Just check checking there's no cheating. Well, how would you check by doing that? I was looking under the blindfolds. Oh, I thought cos they might scream. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's bring on the mums. <laughs> so amongst these mums is the mother of our very own Dr Emily Grossman. Now, without speaking Emily's mum, can you just give us a little wave to identify yourself? So that's Emily's mum. Now, OK, so for the science to work, our mums have been wearing these T-shirts for the last couple of days and have been asked not to use deodorant or any other scented product. Tell me about it. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, using smell alone, the sons and daughters will have to identify who their mum is. So, uh, seeing as it's your fat Noel, if you'd like to bring uh, our first child, Bavini, over. Bavini, come now... with me. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't have sounded any more sinister, Noel. <laughs> if you'd like to uh, walk along the line okay. with Bavini, guide her to each right. uh, mum. Now, obviously, have a good smell, Bavini, don't there be shy. Uh, now, we don't want to give any clues to the children, so we've asked them not to speak during this experiment. Okay. Uh, because, obviously, if Bivini speaks, then it, it sort of shows whereabouts in the lineup she is. So we're going to do this all with miming. Oh, she gave that one a very interesting smell. It's like she was checking that the milk was off. <laughs> OK, Bivini, now, we don't want you to speak, so if you could just turn round. Now, using your fingers, can you tell us which number in the lineup you think smelt like your mum? Noel, could you guide her to that number, please? Yes. Round the uh, back? Around the back, please, yes. And, uh... <laughs> hey, B.A. <-A. laughs> and then just place her behind... There you go. ...that number. OK. So you can't say the numbers, obviously. 
Let's go. Let's go, Alex. Right. Have a good whiff. Have a good whiff, Alex. <laughs> Obviously, this is... Don't this is not the nicest way to find out you're adopted. <laughs> 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 Alex is licking them, is that right? Don't lick them, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> if you've just tuned in, welcome to a different version of Blind Date. OK. OK, if you could guide Alex. OK. And then next up, we're going to go with Charlotte. There you go. All right. Away you go with Charlotte. Not away you go with Charlotte, <laughs> I mean, guide Charlotte. Uh, OK, have a good go. smell of everyone. Good smell. That was a good smell. I like that. You really inhaled there. You went in there didn't you? Don't forget to exhale as well, otherwise you'll just be full of mothers. <laughs> I think because I smell a bit like a goat, it's masking some of the mums. <laughs> this is what Stevie Wonder has to do at the police station after he's been burgled. <laughs> Too much? <laughs> okay, could you hold up the number of the mother you think is yours? OK, if you'd like to place Charlotte in position. That leaves us with just Rachel. You're coming to the car park. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Rachel, have a good smell of everybody. OK, have a lead Can I just in. say how fetching you all look in your blue boiler suits and plain red T-shirts? <laughs> <laughs> Either you weren't close enough or that one was particularly smelly. <laughs> oh, all right. We'll start breastfeeding again. <laughs> Bit awkward, okay. wasn't it? Dumb. Right, uh, so. And if you'd like to uh, place Rachel in position behind the number okay. she thinks is her mother. Come on this way. OK, now that leaves just one place for our own Dr Emily Grossman. Oh, Are you feeling so. confident, Emily? Yeah. Yeah? You don't sound it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of science resting on this. OK, away you go, Emily. <laughs> don't, don't forget, whoever you do choose, you will have to spend the rest of your life with. <laughs> this is where she deliberately chooses the wrong one. <laughs> I'm starting a new life. <laughs> Oh, that was... She's getting a right lungful. She's getting high on mother odour. <laughs> you can have another double sniff if you want to come back and recheck with anyone. <laughs> OK. <laughs> right. <laughs> Emily, could you tell me uh, which one you think was your mother? OK, if you'd like to stand behind... Come on, then. Like <laughs> a fun You're, you're doing this like you're on the edge of a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen Emily so childlike and giggly before. <laughs> OK, so you're all behind your chosen mum. On the count of three, I want you to all take off your blindfolds and see if you correctly identified your mum. And if you did, I'd like you to give your mum a big hug. So, here we go. After three. Three, two, one. If it's your mum, give her a big hug. <laughs> oh, five out of five. What about that? Well, there you have it. Noel, you have proved that you can indeed identify your mum by smell alone. Thank you to all our smellers and smellies. <laughs> Did you go the wrong way? Yeah. Noel went the wrong way, because someone give him directions. <laughs> I would, but I've been here for so long, I've got the curse of knowledge. <laughs> OK, so we've tested Noel's fat, but audience, were you impressed? It's time to give us your score. So let's find out what the average rating for your fat was and where that puts you on the leaderboard. Oh, an impressive eight. <laughs> OK, well, last but not least, Jason, it's your turn. Tell us your fact. My fact is, uh, sort of goes back to, like, a, a playground myth. OK. Um, 30,000 people uh, jumping in the air at the same time and then landing, that's the important bit, uh, <laughs> can create an earthquake. How do really? You like, how do you like them onions? Proper earthquake. Well, I mean, it registered. <laughs> I, I don't know if you've ever been at the football where you see people on the first like tier, oh. and the whole you see the I mean the, the stadiums are built like that to sort of give a bit of give, but it looks like it's really wobbling. You know, it looks yeah, quite dangerous. Yeah. To be honest with you, I've seen some blokes at football matches on their own if they jumped up and down, they'd cause an earthquake. <laughs> No, do you reckon it really would be the same force as an earthquake? Because that's a powerful force. I'm not. I, get I was in an earthquake once. I was drawing at a desk, and the whole desk sort of went <sighs> out, sort of down the room, and then out the door. And did you use the pencil as the Richter scale? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a number seven. <laughs> okay, so you've heard what we think. But join us after the break when we put this to the test. So 
Welcome back to Doc Clack's own Echo, the show that brings you the most brilliant and bizarre facts you've ever heard. Before the break, Jason Manford told us 30,000 people jumping up and down can cause the same power as an earthquake. We need to know for sure. We put it to the test. Football fans are a lively bunch, turning up weekly to support their team through thick and thin. And while suffering the bad games together can create shockwaves throughout the fans, celebrating the good games together can cause shockwaves throughout the earth. Recently, researchers recorded ground movements equivalent to those of a magnitude 0.3 earthquake during a football match when home fans celebrated a goal. When 30,000 people move their centers of mass by half a meter by jumping up and down to celebrate, a huge amount of energy is released and moves into the ground. It's not just the sound of cheering and clapping. A huge surge of energy like this needs synchronized jumping, and that only occurs when the home team scores a goal. Interestingly, an accurate reading can't be measured at the football ground itself. Instead, recordings must be taken approximately half a kilometre away from the stadium to ensure the readings from the entire crowd are calculated. In order to test this groundbreaking fact, we travelled to Leicester, where Leicester City were playing one of the biggest games in the club's history. Go on, Leicester! 30,000 excited fans entered the stadium to watch the match, and because being too close to the ground would affect our results, we let the fans enjoy the game whilst we set up elsewhere. We needed a location 0.5 kilometres away, which would provide the best chance of detecting the seismic power of the crowd. So we set up a lab in a school the correct distance away. The goal will be going in at the ground, but this is where the full impact of the celebration will be felt. Sensitive seismometers were then set to record ground movements, and any shock waves that register on the seismic scale will be represented as a significant spike in signal. And because we can't be at the match, we brought the match to us. Welcome to today's game between Leicester City and West Ham United. The fans have taken their position, the players are ready. The magnitude of this game really is off the scale. Will celebrating a home goal really generate the same power as an earthquake? It was action straight from kickoff. Well, what a two late covers settling into their seats. First chance, West Ham United! And they have... No, they haven't taken the lead! It bounces off the line, and what a major let-off! But is that enough to register anything on our readings? It registered a wobble, but it was no earthquake. Mares. Oh, perpetual movement here from Leicester City. Great move from Conte. Here's the expert in these situations. Vardy! Scores for Leicester City! Which registers 1-0 on the stadium scoreboard. But what does that register with seismic activity? And our seismometer picked up a huge ground tremor caused by the fans. In fact, it registered the same power as a magnitude 0.2 earthquake on the Richter scale. West Ham hit back with two goals, and unsurprisingly, neither goal measured an earthquake. But what's this? Yes, penalty to Leicester City with seconds to go! Unbelievable! We know what it means to the outcome of the Premier League title, but what does it mean when we look at the seismic reading? Surprisingly, this celebration registered a small magnitude 0.1 earthquake. This is because the home goal was a penalty kick, and the home fans were already on their feet expecting the team to score. That said, 30,000 people really can generate the same power as an earthquake. It's 2-2, two, two, two goals for Leicester, and two shockwaves sent into the earth. They did. So, there is the proof. We believe the fact now, do we? I mean, I mean, it's 0 0.2, but it's still a movement. I never specified how good it were. Is it an earthquake <laughs> if it's okay? My thing is, an earthquake felt I felt was like the earth going like, oh, I'm gonna move. But if it's the <laughs> earth not doing that, <laughs> if you just go, I'm gonna force you to move, it's just going, the earth responded like, ah, oh, all right. It, we knocked, we, we effectively used our feet to dig. It wasn't the plates moving, we just made it... We made it do it, but it still created... We made create, it go be, on, the, on the scale, but to it was To be fair, I don't think Jason was saying that it can cause an earthquake. 
He's saying it can cause the same power as never an earthquake. Never said that. <laughs> never said that. OK. OK, let's see what the audience thought. Please, on your keypads, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you score it? OK, Jason, let's find out what the average rating was for that fact. It's a 7. That's, a... That's not bad. Not bad at all, but not everyone was impressed. Jess McHale. Go on, then, Jess. Jess McHale, no one's ever done this in the history of the show. You've written your name and your job title, unless you've just got a very unusual name. <laughs> Jess mean... McHale, student nurse. No, I didn't <laughs> want to <laughs> Jess McHale, student nurse. Oh, oh this is so embarrassing. <laughs> You hated that fact. You gave it a one. Oh, I'm really sorry. I just... Um... I want a lovely Irish response. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I meant to give you a ten. <laughs> but I didn't press the second digit there. What why, happened, Jess? Why, why are you sorry? sorry? No, I just like the mum one better. I just... You like the mum one better yeah. so much so that you went right down to a one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little bit harsh, but no, I didn't like it. That was like... a bit harsh. You didn't like the fact. Are you no. not a football fan? No. No. Do you like earthquakes? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not particularly. OK, sit down, for God's sake. Sorry. So... <laughs> Noel's in the lead, but there's still plenty of time for Jason and Roisin to catch up. In the next round, it's time for Fact Finder. <laughs> Not only do we ask our guests to bring a fact to the show, we also ask our audience. Jason, Noel and Roisin have each picked out an audience fact that they think is the best, and Roisin, you're first. Whose fact have you picked? I've picked Mog's. Could you stand up, Mog? What's your amazing fact? My amazing fact is that um, green and yellow sheets repel bed bugs. Why would they repel bed bugs? Apparently, if you put kind of a green bit of sheet and a yellow bit of sheet in a petri dish yeah. in a lab, and then I think they also looked at red and black, the bed bugs love the red and black, but they don't like the green and yellow. This is really good news for me because my bed sheets are very yellow. <laughs> <laughs> So, OK, and what colour are your bed sheets, Mog? White. I suppose if you call Mog, you're not allowed on the bed anyway. So <laughs> you... <laughs> you just curl up under the radiator. <laughs> so, um, OK, well, that's what do we think? I like that. You might I really like, like it, that. but do you think it's true? Mm, yeah, why what not? What colour are your sheets? I bet they're weird, your sheets. Black. Of course they're black. I sleep in a coffin. <laughs> You see, you're the only person that can say that. We can half laugh and go, do you sleep in a coffin? <laughs> are, you a very, are you a lid up or lid down person? <laughs> I get right in there. I, have, I get it nailed shut. But, uh... <laughs> OK, so it's over to our verifiers. What do we think of Roisin's fact? There is actually some truth in this. No, there can't be. There is. So, bed bugs, as the name suggests, likes to live in beds because they want to be close to their food, which is us. And if you get an infestation, they're really hard to get rid of. So, people are trying to find ways of either repelling them or stopping them coming in the first place. So, researchers took bed bugs, put them in petri dishes, and made little tents for them out of different coloured card. And you think they'd just randomly go all over the place. And they actually went into the red and black tents. And they think it's because bed bugs are red. They like to go in there because they like to be with their own kind. And they went in the black ones because it's all dark and like the crevices where they like to live. And they stayed away from the yellow and green ones because it's obviously like sunlight. And that's actually what they're scared of because they can be seen. So they want to try and hide away. I bet you were a nightmare as a kid, weren't you? <laughs> no, night, no, Simon. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Oh, mother, you're so stupid. <laughs> we have green cotton bed sheets. They won't be biting. <laughs> Dismissed. <laughs> OK, we're scoring at the end once we've heard everyone's fact. Now, your next, Noel. Whose fact have you gone for? Tanya Masterman. <laughs> Tanya Masterman, where are you? What's your amazing fact? The amazing fact is that chickens can change sex. What? A chicken? Yeah, no, I heard you. I mean, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> we were, well, you were, are, are you, yeah, yeah. Is this She's your daughter feeding... or has she changed <laughs> so... her sex? This <laughs> ocean. So she was yeah. feeding our neighbour's chickens. We look after them. You noticed the hen had stopped laying eggs? And then they became, like, one of them became very friendly with the other ones. Yeah. And so we decided to sort of check that everything was we all right. It. So what's, we your, what's your name, daughter? Ocean. Ocean? Yeah. OK. And uh, do you drink heavily, Ocean? I, mean, <laughs> I think what's happened is your chicken's died <laughs> and Mum has gone and replaced it with a boy chicken. I picked this back, but I hadn't heard that nonsense. <laughs> He would like to retract it now, go for someone else. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I was in the lead as well. 
OK. Uh, let's, let's ask the verifiers. What do you think? It's true. Stop it. Yeah. It doesn't happen very often at all, but um, female hens have been known to change into male chickens, cockerels. So they just grow into a cock? <laughs> All chickens start off with two sex organs, or gonads, which haven't become either ovaries or testes yet, and then the female genes kick in, and one of them matures into an ovary, and the other one stays in a sort of dormant, repressed form, even through to adult life. Now, very rarely, it happens about one in 10,000 chickens, the female chicken can either get an illness, or like a tumour, or a cyst, or even sometimes environmental stress, which causes her functioning ovary to shrink and, and, and regress, pull back. She does look and sound like a cock, but she doesn't have a penis. So she's not actually a functioning male, but she can't lay eggs This is either, exactly so my profile on Match.com. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm most shocked about is that the word gonad's like a proper word. That's what I, I am. That's exactly what I was thinking. I didn't realise it was realize a, it was a so scientific relieved. word. <laughs> So, finally, Jason, whose fact have you picked out? Uh, I picked out Jason's fact. Oh, you've gone for a namesake. Gone, yeah, Jason Jones. Jason Jones. Where are you, Jason? Hi. Hi, Jason. You right? What's your amazing fact? My amazing fact is that, statistically, the weather is worse on the weekend, and it's mainly our fault. OK, one thing at a time. <laughs> How can it be statistically worse at the weekend? Well, we drive a lot through the weeks. Yeah. Uh, going, going to and from work, the weekend, we, re we relax, and so do the molecules and uh, the emissions in the air. So, we drive in the week. We dr yeah, we drive to and from work in the yeah. week. Yeah, which is producing a lot so of pollution. Pollution. Lot of pollution. Yeah, and makes sense. As a result of that, it settles in the air and it makes the weather a bit rubbish on the weekend. And then it's cleared perfectly by the Monday morning at 8 o'clock. <laughs> Have you heard yourself? <laughs> Verifiers. <laughs> uh, don't hand over to the verifiers. We're still on you, sunshine. Maggie. <laughs> I've never heard anyone panic before. Verifiers! <laughs> Save me! <laughs> Do we think there's any truth in this? I can believe it, because you... The pollution and, and, and all that, the climate change because of what we're doing, it, it affects loads of things, oddly, that you wouldn't think about. So, I think that's definitely true. I OK. Verifiers. Well, this just sounds like another case of lies, damn lies and statistics, but... Well, let's leave it at that. So... <laughs> <laughs> but, Jason... So, you're wrong, mate. I but told Jason, you. Jason, you're absolutely correct. No, he's not! <laughs> yes, he is. Oh, no, yes, no. Yes, he is. And I've got what? some... It I've takes two science. days to clear, exactly. I've got some science to back it up. Go on. A group in Germany conducted some tests, and they, they did it over 14 years, which is a very good baseline. And they realised that at weekends, it's actually 0.2 degrees colder than it is during the week. And you also get about 15 minutes less sunshine during the weekend. And it is because of what you said. It's the uh, it's aerosol, but not just from cars, but also from industry. So you're absolutely right. So we've heard the facts, but how many points will our verifiers give them? Find out after the break. Before the break, each of our guests chose their favourite fact from the audience. We found out whether each fact is true, but who will get the most points from our verifiers? Let's find out. Roisin, please remind us of your chosen fact. My fact was green and yellow sheets repel bedbugs by Mog. Verifiers? So this could be a great natural way of getting rid of bedbugs, so we've decided to give this an eight. An eight? Good score. <laughs> Noel, remind us of the fact you back. Chickens can choose to change sex. That was uh, Tanya over here. OK. What do we think, Verifiers? How much are we giving this? So, it's a great fact, so we were going to give it a seven. <laughs> and finally, Jason, which fact did you go for? Uh, I went with Jason Jones, who said, weather is statistically worse at the weekends, and it's our fault. Verifiers, yeah. what are we giving this? Well, it's, uh, uh, the scientific study was over a long period, and um, I, I really like it, so I've given it a ten. <laughs> wow! <laughs> I like it. OK, let's pull all over to the leaderboard, see where that puts us. Boom. Jason's yes. in the lead with 17 points. <laughs> There's still time for the rest of you to catch up, though. We've heard the guest facts and the audience have brought theirs, so now it's my turn. It's Max Facts. <laughs> so I've got some facts for you here. All you have to do is guess what they are and I'll give you a point for each one you get right. Now, here are my first clues. We have this, we have this, and we have this. <laughs> that could and... be a rubbish magician. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we think this could be? Uh, 
Sand blows. Sand blows. Nice. <laughs> Sorry, are you guessing or writing a poem? <laughs> Sand blows and water doesn't. <laughs> Wet sand. Wet sand on my hand <laughs> as the wind blows. Hot, wet Hot, sand. Hot, wet All sand. Right, Pev. <laughs> Down blows. Yes. Better, less, less well when it's wet. Yes. No. 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 So you're halfway there. <laughs> my fact is, sand will behave like water if you add air to it. So we have a bigger version to demonstrate this. I'd have got it. I'd have got it. Stick that on there. We'll get rid of these, shall we? Oh, there we go. Oh, you know when you buy a new toy, you haven't got instructions. <laughs> <laughs> Is a duck a witness? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here I have a bed of sand. Now, it's completely normal sand. However, if I turn the blower on and pump air into it, it will start to behave and act like a liquid. So, have a look at this. <laughs> you can move it round. You can stick little things on it. It even splashes. You put a boat on it. Ooh! Put a duck on it. <laughs> That's really good, actually. So, verifiers, can you explain? Um, so, basically, the, the compressed air is being pumped into the sand, and as it rises up through the sand, it fills all the little spaces between the sand granules, and then the sand can actually move around, and there's, there's very little friction uh, for the sand rubbing against the other granules, so it's basically behaving like a, like a fluid, like water. I like that one. Right, OK. Next up, we have... Spinning top. We have this. Tape measure. And we have this. Oh. Basketball. Yes. Right. This has oh. just come straight from my dressing room where I was measuring something. You can measure... <laughs> <laughs> and you were spinning that on the end. <laughs> uh, so... What are we seeing? What do we, what do we think this might be? Is it something with spin... Like, when they do that spinny thing? Very much to do with spinning the ball. The spinning the ball? Yeah. And how, how much... <gasps> Is it from the height which you can drop it to get the best spin on it? Ooh. I'm near, right? You're very near now. So, there's measuring, so... Uh, the circumference of the hat... Well, big hands? What you do with your hand? <laughs> <laughs> you look like you were showing me, like... Oh, so you're spinning it... You're spinning from it. a great height. For what reason? To make a point. <laughs> <laughs> to win. I'm just wondering if you want to go for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what does this, I mean, this do? That's a firm no. <laughs> <laughs> What's this doing? If you spin it, what will happen? While it's spinning, does it change length or... No, or no. Or <laughs> That's better than that. <laughs> OK, I'm going to have to give you the answer. Please do. Okay. My fact is, a small amount of backspin can send a ball hundreds of metres. Yes, hundreds of metres. Let's see the proof. This is fascinating. Watch this. So this is a ball being dropped without any backspin at all, OK? Straight down. There you go. Watch out, kid! <laughs> Sorry about that, mate. OK, not much happened there, but now let's see what happens when you put a bit of backspin on the ball. Wow. That is incredible, isn't it? And that is how we beat the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> and you think I'm joking, but verifiers, tell us more. Well, this is actually an effect known as the Magnus effect. The what? Magnus. Oh, Magnus. I thought you said the Magnus effect. No, Magnus. I thought that's a different effect. That's where you, like, drink in the afternoon and wake up in a bush. <laughs> <laughs> Now, actually, I'm going to have to ask Simon to help because I haven't got enough hands. But um, if you imagine a ball um, sort of falling and the air is spinning around it, but it's also the ball is falling through the air. So you've got two lots of spin. You've got sort of spin from the ball and you've got airflow from the fall. Now, what happens is if we freeze the action, as the ball is spinning, the airflow on this side of the ball is actually um, working against the airflow upwards. So what you do is get a build up of pressure here. But on this side, the airflow and the spin is actually working together. So you actually get a combination. The air is moving faster, so you get less pressure here. Now, this is a classic uh, example of the Bernoulli effect, which keeps aeroplanes up in the air. So the um, ball will travel from the high pressure to the low pressure, and so the ball gets carried off into the distance. Now, Lee did mention that um, uh, this is what won the Second World War, and this is actually true, because um, uh, the dam busters, you know, when they were actually using the bombs to take down dams, they were actually using the Magnus effect to very good effect to win the Second World War. Uh, right, we'll get rid of that. 
My next fact tonight is this. All right. Oh. Nice. Um, it's like you smashed up one of your awards. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what so many to spare, though. <laughs> so, so what are we seeing? I don't know. Put it's... ice and, and sawdust together and it, then it's better. That's what? exactly the right answer. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Never ever seen so much lack of commitment yeah! for an answer, but it's right. <laughs> My fact is, adding a cup of sawdust to ice makes it as strong as concrete. Before we test the fact, Simon, can you tell us more? Yes, this is a material called picrete, and it was invented during World War II by a chap called Geoffrey Pike, and it's incredibly strong and resilient. So strong and resilient that during the war, it was proposed that you could build huge, unsinkable aircraft carriers out of it, and it was called Project Habakkuk. Now, picrete is a mixture of 15% sawdust and 85% water, and when it's frozen, the sawdust reinforces the molecular bonds inside it, and it's almost like how steel is used to reinforce concrete. Now, this is so good, it makes the mixture 14 times stronger than ice on its own, roughly the same as concrete, as we're about to find out. So it's time to test this. Now, here we have sheets of plain ice with no added sawdust. They look strong, but when we roll our bowling ball into them, they should smash into pieces. Jason, would you like to do the honours? I'd love to, yeah. OK, yeah. so this is normal ice. Right. And this is a normal bowling ball. OK. And you are a normal person. <laughs> yeah. Put those things together, right. and we have a normal situation. Do it quite hard, then, or just let it roll? Chat Can... up lines later, Jason. <laughs> right, here we go. Right. Go for it. <laughs> oh, well, there we go. Pretty impressed that. OK, now we'll replace the sheets of ice with picrete. Again, this is just a cup of sawdust, like this, added to the ice. And as ever, all my recipes are available on CFAX. <laughs> if the science is correct, this time it should not smash. In fact, I'm so confident of this, I'm happy to put my face behind the sheet of ice. However, <laughs> this is my passport to success, and others have less to lose. Nolan Roisin. <laughs> Would you like to take a seat, please? <laughs> Come over here. Now, get your face nice and close to the ice. There you go. <laughs> I'm not sit. sure about this. Oh, I'm not, so I'm not doing it. <laughs> there you go. Sit yourself down there. Science, no. Science. So, get your, get your thing nice and close. Don't lick it, cos it's all you've got to save your lives. <laughs> right. Look at each other for the last on the right time. side, Jason. If it goes through and hits them, you will at least get ten points for a strike. <laughs> right, are you ready? Are we ready back there? I cannot believe I'm going to get killed by a 1920s greengrocer. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Jason, on the count of three, I want you to release the bowling ball. Are we ready? Three, oh, two, no, one. Release the ball! <laughs> oh! oh. <laughs> a bit came off. So there you go, fat proof. Adding a cup of sawdust to ice makes it as strong as concrete. They were my facts. Let's see the final scores. Congratulations, Jason is the winner. That's it for tonight's show. A huge thank you to our verifiers and our special guests, Russian Connery, Noel Fielding and Jason Manford. I'll see you next time. Good night.